Welcome to Recruiting.Work, a place to connect, communicate, and collaborate on all things recruitment. This session is brought to you by Outmatch. Just as Recruiting.Work brings people in the talent community together, Outmatch brings recruitment technologies together, combining assessments, video interviewing, and reference checking software through creating a more holistic, more human hiring experience. Learn more at Outmatch.com. All right, let's jump right into it. Thank you, everybody, for coming back in 2021 for another year of recruiting roundtables with Recruiting Network. Uh, took some time off with the holiday break. I'm just, hopefully, everybody else did too. So we're getting back into the swing of things, getting into the rhythm. So I may have to shrug off some of the rust from not doing these for a month, but I hope it'll go smooth. Uh, we're starting our series up again. Probably not going to be doing three a week like we used to, but kind of do two a week. And then I'm going to be trying to see if I can do some little offshoots around uh, other types of discussions to just uh, mix it up a little bit as we go here in 2021. We also have a new partner in support of the group. It's outmatch.com. They are an in industry and they are all about making the candidate experience the best experience it can be by layering on top of an ATS. So they're not an ATS product, but they make your ATS better. So if you get a chance, please check them out. Our topic for today is the anatomy of a great recruiting program. And with us, we have Jessica Moroda out of Boston, William Uranga out of Phoenix, Matthew Liptek out of Boston, uh, Sarah Fatima should be joining us. Hopefully she'll get in here. And then Yvette Fierson out of Atlanta. Uh, so again, starting up a new year, still dealing with COVID. Looks like we're going to still be dealing with it for the foreseeable future that I kind of gave up trying to hope it would end and just... It's going to come to the fact when it ends, it ends, and then we'll keep going from there. So it's still an issue in 2021. Hopefully it'll end soon enough. But with that said, let me uh, get off to this one. And with, we're going to talk around, hey, what's making up a great recruiting program? Still dealing with uh, COVID, but also just kind of the ideal and the best anatomy of it. So Jessica, can we jump over to you and have you kick it off? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to kick it off. Oh, um, hey, real quick. Welcome back, everyone. Jessica. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Real quick to the audience. Uh, I forgot to say this. A little housekeeping item. If you want to chat, and I highly encourage you to, if you go into the chat area, there is a little link, a drop-down menu at the bottom. It's, it's going to default to say all panelists. I just need everybody to click on that and to say all panelists and attendees. So for all the attendees, I want you to be able to communicate with each other in addition to the panelists. We want to hog the conversations. So please feel free to add any comments or questions that you have in that section, but be sure to change it to all panelists and attendees. All right. I told you I was rub rubbing off some of the rest. Jessica, <laughs> back to you. Jessica at the cobwebs. Okay, awesome. Um, so anatomy of a great recruiting program. <clears throat> I'd love to start us off this way. Six years ago, about six years ago, I don't know if lots of people remember Virgin Media, um, they got about 150,000 job applicants. Um, it resulted in 3,500 new hires. And so they did a little research and they found out that about 18% of these applicants, it breaks it down to about 27,000 people, were actually also customers. Um, so Unfortunately, some of these folks had poor candidate experiences, and it led to over 7,000 um, customers to leave Virgin Media. And at the end of the day, it led to a $6 million revenue loss for Virgin Media. Um, that is a perfect example of why it's important, right? So I was thinking about ways to, to kick it off today, and it feels like a given. Kim experiences it. It feels like a given that we should just provide a stellar candidate experience. I think that Communication is, is the biggest driver of a positive candidate experience, but at the end of the day, it, it's an impact on revenue, right? IBM did a survey where um, they learned that only 25% of satisfied candidates are likely to become new customers. I'm getting a little feedback, so I apologize if you guys are as well. But that number actually will jump to 53% of satisfied customers, right? So it impacts our bottom line. At the end of the day, we want to drive a positive candidate experience because it makes a positive impact or it can make a negative impact on revenue. And that's how we get the buy-in from, from our leads, right? And we need to make sure that we are giving people timely feedback, um, crisp, concise, clear, 
feedback, not just we decided to move forward with someone who did a better, you know, job in the interview, very specific feedback, I think is important. Um, and I find that people are very open to this feedback. The other piece is if you think about um, people sharing their experiences uh, on social media, I think it's about 83% of people who have a bad experience will shout it from the rooftop, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, and about 72% of those who have a positive experience um, will shut it from the rooftops as well. So it drives down to real impact on our organization, our brand, um, and it speaks to having a really strong recruiting program. So that, that's what I'll kick it off with. I'd love to hear from any of my peers what their thoughts are around the Canada experience. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely one of the key areas of a great recruiting program. And I think the white, I go back to that white glove experience that I've seen in other businesses and try to adapt that model to the recruiting program, the candidate experience. I have to say, I've been through some processes where I've been left hanging just in the dark, no feedback, no responses, and it soured me on the company to this day. And this happened years ago. And I still will tell people the story. And I, I won't name the company. It's a Boston-based company, very large company. But it, they left me high and dry with no feedback or no response from a, a, a rigorous interview process. And that left yeah. a bad taste in my mouth. Absolutely. There was a, a great question from Sean in there. Um, oh, and William is going to hit on that too. Sean, what I would say is, I, I, I am, I don't know that we're really unique, but I've never worked in agency, right? And there is a piece of, of my agency peers that have this um, edge to them that I try to steal from them. Like being always a corporate recruiter, there's a piece of it, uh, of somebody who's worked in the agency has a really cool, you know, edge to it. But being a corporate, corporate recruiter my entire career, um, I tend to be probably a little bit more candid than I should. Um, I think that, you know, I always ask him this first. So I think that's important. Right. If I decline somebody and decide, you know, we decided to go in another direction, are you open to feedback? So I think it's important to ask the candidate first. And I think you give as candid as you can. Are we setting like a bar to ensure that candidate experience versus somebody who just applied and never, let's say they never got screened past the recruiter versus somebody who came in for on site interviews or have moved down the, the flow? Is there a different level of? Concierge service, yeah. for lack of better words? Yeah. So at Forrester, I will say, you know, a lot of our roles go through um, this, the research roles at the end, the last stages of writing and presentation, and that process is rigorous, right? They actually have access to Forrester.com, and they are going through editing drafts of reports. It is really hard to tell somebody after they've invested 40 hours of work into a process, they didn't get a job. Um, that said, that's where I pull in my hearing manager. If I screen somebody... I have no problem declining them. I decline the, that person that we may not move forward with, but I ask the hiring manager to follow up right away, even if it's an email. And sort of the, how about high volume versus low volume racks where you, you know, it's kind of impossible to, to get back to everybody at a personal level with a high volume rack. I assume just about all recruiters are doing that for the lower level. Yeah. It, that's interesting that you say that. So we just made that shift. We're seeing high volume of applicants um, during this time. And we do get a high volume for some of the more junior roles. Um, we just implemented a shift. So our initially when you applied, it said, hey, we'll be in touch if you're a fit. Um, and we just switched it to that's still going out. But now we're getting back to people within 10 days of applying. If they're not a fit, we're making sure we send rejection emails. That's new for us um, because it we were getting nervous about timeline and, you know, what if someone applied a month ago? Um, so we went through and we audited a little bit and we've gotten really positive feedback from people who have applied and even not gotten an interview. Thank you for following up. Yeah, no, that's kudos, Jessica. If people are not talking about what their selection practices are and how they communicate along each step of the way on their website, at least, or via email for somebody that's getting an acknowledgement, you're just setting yourself up for a world of hurt and you've seeded the storyline to the experience of the candidate, whatever they think should be happening or not happening, the, their interpretation. And that's what you get in glass door as a result. And then you got to do rear guard action, you know, on glass door to fix that. So if you, if you, you know, best practices are yes, declare it up front what you're going to do and, and then follow through and do it. 
and people will respect for that. They may not like the, the response that you're they're going to get that they're not selected. Nobody likes their baby to be told that they're ugly and stuff like that. But if you if, if you're doing so within the, the what you've already said as uh, expectations, then you're you're doing a great job. Yeah. So just a quick question on that, getting that 10 day turnaround time. Are you, are you, oh, go ahead, Yvette. Did you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to, going to add that. Yeah. For the, for the high volume where you have a lot of candidates um, that, that apply, those weren't necessarily to me, the candidate, but for anyone that I talk to that I phone screen once I get the feedback from the hiring manager, it's important to me that I turn around and communicate with them. One, because if you don't, they will email you and call you a million times um, because they're anxious. And so I always try to put myself in the position of if I was looking for a job, I want feedback, good, bad or indifferent. I just need to know what my next step should be. If this is not it, do you have any kind of advice for me and how I should move on? That that to me is just the ultimate. But then the other ones that I would actually pick up and, and give a phone call to are those who actually interview with the hiring manager. So I have those that I phone screen and those that I sent to the hiring manager. Those are the ones that get the personal touch, maybe get the phone call, maybe get more in-depth response from me. But generally speaking, everyone else who just applied, when I go through brass ring and I see that you're not a fit, you should automatically get that letter to say I'm proceeding with someone else. I don't like anybody wasting my time and I don't like to waste their time. And so if they're not a fit, let's just move on, disposition and simplify the process, I, I would say. You'd be shocked at the messages that I've received from candidates, just like Yvette was saying, that are early on in the process that we've declined, sent the general template email to saying, sorry, we're gonna move forward with other candidates. They are so appreciative of the fact that we even got back to them. It shocks me that companies aren't sending any type of replies to candidates. So let me ask a question around that, that initial get back response for just the people who, who applied starting from there. Typically, I would work, work in, in recruiting, watch the what I call the unreviewed rate, which means the, and that a person applied, the recruiter just never had the time or, or need right, or what have you, to even look at the resume. And the numbers are always kind of scary high. Right. So Jessica, with like implementing like a 10-day turnaround, are you essentially getting down to like that zero unreviewed rate? It's a really good question. I think it's, yeah, yeah. We've, we've been better about making sure we're looking at all applicants. We don't see high numbers for some of the roles, but we see high numbers for more that some of the ju more junior roles or for example, you know, a VP customer experience. There's a lot of folks, really good folks out of, out of work right now. Um, but we are making an effort to go through all of them. But, you know, if you go through maybe 20 this week and you can disposition those next week, making sure you got like that last group and you didn't miss that 10 day mark, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. Sean, I was also going to add, you, you need to make sure that people get the acknowledgement note as well, that they've even applied, even the, the basic that they made it through. Then the other thing is also to be looking at, and I guess I touched a little bit on this uh, in, in my session, is that you need to make sure that you have the right screening practices up front. Because if you're being overwhelmed with too many applicants, then, and you don't have enough people either helping you, if it's a manpower issue, then you need to think of some way of automating some of the selection criteria or cut getting to some shorthand that's reliable from a signal standpoint. So that you can really focus on the ones you do want to invest time with and just as well, you know, uh, decline or reject those that, that don't fit. Yeah. Um, it, it can be done. You just need to stop and think about it. The other thing too, is even if you filled all your positions, you're throwing away great people that could be set for the next uh, class of trainees that you have for customer care, whatever, whatever the high volume position is, you're throwing away good people and you shouldn't be doing that. You should also have messaging out saying, Hey, this role's filled. Uh, sorry, we couldn't talk to you, but we'd like to consider you for the next group or next time the position open. If you're not doing that, I, you know, you're just doing double work. I, I don't, and I don't know why people would want to do that. Yeah, William, do you just want to roll into your your baseline messaging piece? <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the the messaging part uh, because a lot of it had to do with the the website. Uh, and I'll just offer for people that want the list. I've got like 17 items to cover on that, and I'm not gonna 
uh, I'm not going to subject my dear panelists uh, <laughs> to that, but I will talk about the vetting side a little bit uh, to make sure that that people have at least reviewed what they have. And for, yeah, I'll be guilty of, I'll be doing stuff for a couple of years and somebody will ask a question, why do we do it that way? I just realized, ah, I never stopped and, and, and thought twice about, you know, the assumptions behind that. So uh, this goes for some of the, uh, the basics forward here. So um, you know, with regards to, to job descriptions, role descriptions, are you actually talking about deliverables, not just a list of requirements? If you're not talking about what the deliverables are for this role, you're missing talking about what this position entails and, and what sort of environment. And uh, also for, you know, speaking of some of the storytelling that Jessica was uh, sharing as far as stats, um, you know, guys will, will, men will typically, they're applying, hey, if they meet 60% of the list, they'll apply. It turns out women will only apply if they meet 90% of the requirements. So the longer the list you have, the more you're acing out diversity for your roles. So, you know, re rethink that as far as uh, if you need a shopping list with your hiring manager of, of requirements. What must they actually deliver? And if you're given an idea also what the daily activities, how much is designing, how much is executing, how much is maintaining, you also kind of separate people that are driven differently as well. Uh, you don't have to come out with buckets like that, but you can talk about that in the second paragraph description. Uh, also for vetting, keeping your interview teams small. More perspectives uh, for, for interviews of a role does not make a better hiring decision. It's not necessarily more data, it's just more opinions, if you will. <laughs> so keep the interview team small. Your coordinators will thank you. You'll have more thoughtful discussions and going, going from there. Find a champion besides the hiring manager in that function if you're dealing with a, a, a functional related role uh, that understands and advocates the hiring bar and actually cares about the quality of hires for that group. To have an internal ally as a fellow engineer, as a fellow peer in the company, to really advocate for that bar being set and, and holding their, their peers to that. Uh, and then training, my goodness, uh, training. It, I, everybody has experiences, some of them good, some of them bad with regards to interviewing experiences. Uh, put everybody on the same page in your organization. If you haven't done training before, pull something together and put everybody through it. It is really, uh, it is really hard uh, to otherwise pull people on the same page as far as expectations uh, to do that. Uh, particularly, we spend a lot of time around what uh, what constitutes a great question, and what are the components of a great answer. Um, so that that's one thing, and then make sure people submit feedback, complete feedback, the questions they asked, and the answers, at least in summary form, that they understood to be given. Uh, we require before people can join the debrief meeting after the whole interview team has met with a the candidate, if they haven't submitted their feedback. We don't hold the debrief which really pulls the hiring manager on your side and getting the feedback in uh, for that. Um, the next question is how much uh, you know, technical vetting can you push forward in the selection process? Can you actually entrust your recruiters with asking technical questions? Uh, we do this a lot since we do a lot of software engineering. Uh, I'm asking uh, candidates what, what's JavaScript closure? If you can ask those sort of valuable sort of questions up front tends to be knowledge based, the more you can weed out and the more you understand what positions you're actually trying to hire or say yes to on the, on the back end. Uh, let's see what else here. Uh, with regards to uh, what can the candidate demonstrate uh, with regards to either exercise, take home, code pairing, whatever it is, what can they actually do that gives them a, an idea of what a, a day in the life of, a, of an engineer, marketer, whatever it is uh, that they're doing as far as key skills uh, be performed and be measured against. Um, uh, one of the tools I'm testing out right now, for example, is seeing if during my phone screens I have with candidates, is it best if I use a, a voice to text of capturing uh, the responses from my candidates? This isn't video interviewing, but it's actually just trying to you know, have a thoughtful conversation without me having to think about what I'm typing, but really engaging better with the candidate. Uh, rather than trying to feverishly, you know, type and, and capture what was just said to me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you know, do you are your recruiters actually monitor the on-site interview? Uh, you know, what if what if a candidate is um, not doing so well and, and you need to 
to cut the interview short. Uh, and that can be a controversy for some teams. Do we cut it short or do we just let it go on? Uh, if you do cut it short, what's your plan? Uh, how, how do you know what's going on during, uh, during the interview, particularly if it's quote unquote, the onsite interview where you have a series of them back to back? Uh, do you or the recruiters actually lead the debrief meeting? And how much do you actually lead? Do you actually walk in knowing what, what the feedback is? Do you know what the scoring is? Do you know what the trouble issues are? If you do that, you're able to lead much more thoughtful conversations as opposed to just doing a round robin, say, everybody give your feedback and then hire a manager, what do you think? And, and wait for them to respond. You should be driving that conversation with the hiring manager as far as what the core issues are what's worth the trading off and having a thoughtful discussion. And of course, that depends upon how consensus driven your environment is versus how much the decision or authority the, uh, the hiring manager has, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll have, I, I, there was one debrief I was in in which uh, everybody was thumbs up, but nobody was really speaking for the candidate in, in the sense of, I'm excited to have the candidate. I said, well, it sounds like we're not really excited about this candidate, so why don't we just go ahead and decline them and, and move on. And all of a sudden the room erupted because everybody was super excited about the candidate, but nobody was actually dialed in, uh, in into the conversation. So look for that. You know, make sure people are, are present in that meeting. This isn't just another thing to check off the box for the, for the day, but is actually a crucial part of building a team or adding another you know B player, heaven forbid, right? Uh, and then also, when do you actually promise to get back to the can? This is where I was tying back into what Jessica was saying a little bit earlier. Uh, I actually, and my uh, recruiters actually call the candidate at least 24 hours, usually 48, 72 hours before the last series of interviews, kind of what we call our on-site via video. And we walk the candidate through who they're going to meet, what the focus areas are, and in general, just how we do video interviewing. And in addition to that, we talk about that they're going to get a candidate survey. They're also getting a copy of our benefits. And that when the debrief meeting is scheduled, we tell them that because we promised them that within 24 hours, we're going to get back to them with what the feedback is and would like to hear their feedback. And that feedback is going to be given live. It's not going to be given via a Jirjan email or a text. It's going to be by phone, maybe by video, it depends upon you know how easy the can is to get back. The candidates respect this; they really appreciate okay. the time that you're investing with them. And it does take time to do it, and it's not comfortable to deliver, particularly the you know the the news of rejection. But they respect it so much more uh, because of the time they've already put into the process as well. So uh, those are just some of the thoughts with regard with regards to the vetting. So. I love the one thing that I'll just say that I love that, that you said that I missed and I think is crucial is that prep call, right? We're not giving them the answers to the test. We're just saying, here's how to study for the test. And if I don't help you study, I'm not doing my job, right? You're not setting them up for success. I love that. Yeah, we, we found that too many people were being surprised. <laughs> well, I didn't think they were going to ask me that. So we don't ask, we don't tell them what the questions are. To, to be super, super clear with everybody, we actually, we tell them what the topic areas are and why we're gonna cover those topics. And they appreciate that. So they know they need to, you know, and then we'll give them feedback from the earlier sessions. So if somebody didn't do well in JavaScript, it's like, hey, you know, you may wanna brush up on JavaScript. If they don't, it's on them, right? There's something to say about a company that sets the candidates up for success as they go through the process. You don't wanna see the candidate fail the interview. No. You wanna help the candidate right. succeed and the final outcome being the hire. So. I think that's excellent. It, it's a great point, Matt. I mean, you have actually have better conversations when people aren't <laughs> you know, flinching for, you know, from the next surprise that they're going to get, but actually thoughtfully talk, you know, uh, about what's going on. And they, they, they know what's going to be covered. They don't know how it's going to be covered, but they know what's going to be covered. So yeah. Great point, Matthew. Quick, quick question around the, the survey that you said you do with them to kind of elaborate. So you're doing like a phone call, to get that satisfaction back from the no, candidate? No, that survey is actually an email one. Okay. Yeah, and 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 we, we take great pains to explain that it has both quantitative and open text, uh, that nobody in the interview team is going to see the results, so it's not going to impact any of their, their feedback that they give, uh, and we do give it out in, in aggregate form anyway with all, all candidates. 
yeah but that's something that the coordinators run on the other side so is it the same survey for everybody and the only reason why i'm asking because I, I think that's a big question to ask hey how are we doing both the candidates and to hire managers on an ongoing basis so this is just for the candidates and it's done yeah regardless of the position we're now talking about moving uh up to do another survey at the hiring manager screen, which is the technical one after, well, it is a technical one for the position after the recruiter, um, just because we're wanting to get some more more data points earlier. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we used to do the hiring manager one. we didn't learn a whole lot. Um, people were telling us what they thought, they weren't waiting for the survey internally. So <laughs> we were getting that feedback anyway. Got it. Uh, so to the other panelists, are you, are you Companies doing surveys of any sort to, to candidate side? We haven't done, uh, we have not started that yet. Uh, we've we talked about it. <laughs> we were doing candidate experience surveys. Um, and then we, I'm not, we were scoring really well and, they, and we weren't getting a lot of differentiation. There was, some, there was some stuff in there that I think we could learn from. What we're trying to do is drive people to Glassdoor. We haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> if anybody has feedback on that, let us know. Yeah. It's hard to say, here, come do our survey, and oh, by the way, feel free to go to Glassdoor. So we're, we're trying to balance it right now, but we stopped spending it. Um, yeah. It's we a little bit of a mess survey sure. out uh, during the interview process. And right now, because things are done by video, it could be over a couple different days. So they don't necessarily know if they're getting an offer. Um, right. Some do find out, some don't. Um, I mean, by the time they, they fill it out. And so we don't control that. So we figure that's kind of a, a known variable uh, or risk to uh, say. But I will say if we do see an overall score, the coordinator that does get it, they do send an invite to Glassdoor to fill out Glassdoor. So oh, that's okay. how we are. All right, that's not a bad idea. Okay, all right. Yeah, I've, I've worked with companies who have done the surveys before and you get your feedback. And to me, that kind of helps you um, critique yourself um, as the recruiter to see what you need to do, what you need to change, what you need to implement. Um, but like I said, I just try to always put myself in their shoes and what I would want to see when I'm going through the interview process. Because like Matthew said earlier, I have been left hanging and you don't, you're like, well, what's going on? Sometimes it is that they have closed the position and they're not hiring for it anymore, but I was never communicated to me. So I'm just left lingering, hanging on, like, should I still be considering this? I, I mean, for personally, I have a rule of thumb. If I don't hear back within two weeks, then I'm on to the next, but I'm, all, I'm already in, in the mix with other companies when I start to look for an opportunity. Um, the company I'm currently with, they do not do satisfaction surveys. Um, I think that uh, it's been my experience over 20 years where I've worked with companies that have done it and companies that, that haven't done it. I would say more do it today than they did 20 years ago because we didn't care about candidate experience. We were the people of authority. We were the ones who were hiring. So we don't care what you think. And now I think with every, with, with the way things have moved and, and graduated recently with branding yourself, with Glassdoor being out there. I, I always tell people to go to Glassdoor. I absolutely love it. It is the good, the bad, and the ugly of whatever company that you apply for, interview with, um, just so you can get a real candid um, idea about what you're dealing with. And so now I think that pe now that that's out there, people are beginning to focus on what does Glassdoor say? What does LinkedIn say about this company? And reputation now um, proceeds. And applicants have really kind of taken control and saying, look, we have to say so for who we want to who we want to work for. And some companies do it great. Like Google has put it out there. Great place to work. Some people not so much. But now that you have all this talent pool, it's becoming very competitive. Companies are being forced to look at the, the candidate satisfaction in, in the whole process and, and changing it and, and vamping it to those needs. Even if it comes down to an NPS score, yeah. and that, that's the only one. Yep. Uh, hey, William, question for you around the vetting process. Uh, in your, are you doing tech screens for your developers where they have to take a test in certain areas? Um, you know, we've not automated that area yet um, for, for, for software developers. That can be done. The key thing is finding, you know, questions. Uh, the hard thing with things like uh, Codility, uh, Hacker Earth, Hacker World, are, is that they do have questions that can be automatically machine scored. Uh, and that's good. 
But the hard part is coming up with a question that reflects your environment that can also be machine scored. Most developers are not used to thinking about how a machine would score it, and it's a different it's a different process. So we've just not jumped into that yet. But we do ask more knowledge based questions. Recruiters do, um, you know, difference between inline and inline block, and uh, you know what's a what's a um, um, a max heap or min heap. I mean, stuff that's knowledge based, uh, you know, computer science, but that the the the, def, the responses, the answers, responses are knowable. Uh, and you don't, you can, you know, it's not an issue of how creative you can be. It's 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 pretty pretty basic stuff that we look for in that sense. So we kind of get some of the questions like because we're hiring full stack, for example, somebody doesn't know JavaScript, they probably don't know the front end. <laughs> is, is is kind of the, the default there. So we kind of get the, the the basic blocker questions of the way. So that way that the next section with the hiring manager or a technical screener that does check for coding or algorithms, they can go to town. Oh, you said you knew JavaScript, you answered JavaScript question, let's, let's just plumb the depths of that. So we're trying to value the engineer's time a little bit more by uh, by doing it. Of course, we'd love to ask that upfront when they apply. Hey, do you, do you know JavaScript? The problem is, is what people think they they know versus what they can actually answer are often two different things. Got it. Yeah, I just think that the whole testing world or testing industry is is interesting to me. I've yet to see somebody who found the holy grail in it. And usually it's around tech side, but I've used it where at Universal Music, we hired a lot of admin coordinators. So we would test in Excel. I'm like, how well do you know Excel? Because you're going to be living in it. And that was just a great way to engage with the candidates and then get meaningful feedback back. From that. Yeah, and how you do the test needs to be meaningful too. I'm not gonna ask somebody that's been uh, as a principal engineer, here, here's something with codility. They'd be absolutely insulted if I did that off the bat. You know, no warm up. you know, it's like, you know, a bad date, right? Um, so you would definitely wanna build a rapport and respect up front before you start asking that so they have context and they know that you appreciate where they're coming from. Uh, yeah. You can do that a little bit easier with, with say mid-level or, or earlier uh, talent. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to see the drop off rate on a tech guy getting asked to take the test and did they, or were woman, and did they take it or did they not? All right. Thanks, William. Hey, Matt, can we jump over to you? Yeah, I wanted to uh, talk about, and this is included in all the panelists, uh, the recruiting process, setting up a concrete process that's understandable by the recruiting team and the hiring managers, and it's relayed to both sides, where we can have a step by step process in place to recruit the right talent. And we're talking start to finish, full life cycle recruitment, having a process in place where we can identify what happens at the beginning, what happens in the middle, what happens at the end. Phone screens, how many stages of interviews a candidate will go through depending on their level, uh, how the interview panel will be set up based on uh, behavioral or competency-based interviewing, uh, how the hiring managers will uh, relay their feedback about the candidates, uh, how we will relay the feedback back to the candidates, and then how we have the final outcome with reference checking, uh, offer stages, and also if there is any assessment tests like we were just discussing, if there's any assessments throughout that process, having those stages set up. And I think I've come into organizations that don't particularly have a process in place. And I think it's important to outline the process, have everyone understand and be on the same page with that process. And that, to me, is very the backbone of really that recruitment life cycle. And then getting the metrics from the process and feeding in some of the data from that process, some of the fall-offs throughout the process of candidates, where they're falling off. And then we can also get some of the diversity data from that as well. And I think that that's very important nowadays, especially with the data intake, uh, what we're feeding up in far, as far as metrics, and if we're feeding that into a dashboard, uh, that I've, I've, I've actually been using to actually measure the recruitment team and also the hiring managers and then assessing that. And, you know, we can also put in different uh, steps in that process as well with the intake meeting at the beginning, uh, having some of the roundtable discussions throughout. If a job description needs to be tweaked or changed, uh, depending on what types of talent we're finding. And then also the pipeline of candidates, you know, how, 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 how uh, filled is that pipeline? If it is not filled, what do we do as a next step? And some of the strategies around that, uh, outlining also the sourcing strategies to the hiring managers and letting them know where we're finding candidates and where we're tapping into. And then also putting the candidates through 
not too long a process going back to candidate experience. So we know that the candidates are appreciative of the fact that we are managing their time appropriately. And I think that's very important. Matt, is it delivering that message? And this sort of goes back to William, some things that you were pointing out about the internal processes and kind of like the best practice. Kind of speaking around, you go into a company that doesn't have a process in place. Let's just put the template like that. Is that a message that's coming from you, from your recruiters, from both of you? Is it kind of you deliver it and we're good to go? Or is it sort of an ongoing message that just has to be continually, hey, this is the way we do it here? I think it's an ongoing message. Uh, you know, absolutely. I think that for, for an organization, and I've come into a lot of startups that don't have any process at all, uh, that an organization that doesn't have a concrete process to put candidates through a system, through a funnel, and for them to just be, you know, it, it's just like the Wild West. I call it the Wild West. It's just all over the place. You know, the managers are not knowing who to go to with feedback. The recruiters are just slinging paper, very transactional processes. I think it's a continued driving home the message that this is our new process. This is the way we do things and have a centralized point for all the managers to come to, you know, that centralized process. You have to have that center of recruiting excellence, I would call it, that managers know who they should be going to with feedback, who they come to with an open requisition, and then they understand that process. And I think the recruiters drive the message as well, but I think it comes from the talent leader to start. You're dash- totally agree with oh. everything Matt just said. Um, you know, maybe you go back and, and cite practices of other bigger companies, maybe you tie it into your values, uh, but find a way to anchor it into the organization and repeat it often and politely in context, uh, so particularly with the leadership. Uh, if you have it bottom in the leadership, then that makes training, it makes documentation, it means referencing it a lot easier. And hopefully your recruiters aren't saying, well, hey, it was Matt's or William's idea uh, to do this, <laughs> because that <laughs> means they don't own it either uh, for that. But, but if yeah. you kick off the meetings, what you're going to cover, it shows you're respecting the time, it shows why you're doing it. Um, uh, the intake meeting or what we call a kickoff meeting because we thought intake was too uh, well uh, psychologically damaging <laughs> for, for a, more of a hospice or a hospital uh, case. Uh, we did a kickoff meeting and then we have a calibration meeting with the interview team after that. After they pick the interview team, pick the focus areas, we get try to get everybody on the same page of what we're looking at because everybody will have a, uh, a focus area or two that they're focusing on. They don't have the whole picture but that's to put the, that in the perspective so that what we're expecting people to, to cover in their focus areas. And then they go off and create their, their questions from that. One of the important moves we do after that is that we then send uh, as, as a recruiter an invitation for referrals at that point, because they know exactly what we're looking for. And that's a great time to hit them up. That's good. That's good. Well, I think it's important that the recruiters switch their, their style from transactional to more strategic. And we relay that messaging. You know, they become that talent advisor, that true partner to the hiring managers. And we have the communication flow between them as a partner. And that has to be delivered to the the hiring managers and to the organization to show that we're changing as a TA team and as a TA function to become that partner. Are are you using... You spoke of the dashboard. Are you using a dashboard to kind of deliver that message? Because my past experience is consulting and, and sourcing. The quickest thing I wanted to do was to get something on the screen for everybody to speak to rather than yeah. just having a conversation back and forth. It just flip, flips a switch in people. In my experience, they can see something to speak to. Here, here everything comes. You, you spoke of a dashboard. And I'm starting to learn in the dashboards. I, I just had a conversation with a, a TA leader who has got heavy Q1 hiring, right? They're heavy Q1, and then the rest of the year is kind of down. So he showed by the numbers on the dashboard. Well, if we need this many hires, we mean this many interviews and screens, which means I need this much of your team from your hiring team. You still got to do your job. Can you provide these many hours back in interviewing? And I'm like, well, no, we can't do that. That's why we can't have all the hiring in Q1. Right. But that he used a dashboard to show that. Are you utilizing that dashboard or anything like that? Yeah, there's something to say about pictures and visual graphics to display to a hiring manager the source of hire, the time to fills, you know, uh, the, the recruiting funnel, the open positions and the dispositions throughout. 
So yeah, there is a dashboard we developed. Uh, it's on Power BI. We did look at t- Tableau, but we also looked at some third parties that actually are, are developing dashboards that are true partners that will take your data from the ATS or the HRIS system and feed it into their outs- you know, an outsource dashboard that's real time using APIs. And it really is something. It's streamlined and it's, it's a way to tell the story to the hiring managers. It's a different way. Yeah. yeah. Years, years ago, I worked with a VC. I worked out into the VC business and I had to build a dashboard so all the general partners could go out to their investment companies with an iPad and pull everything up that they're doing for that portfolio company on the iPad. So it was all, everything has to be in the system, but it was the power of the visual. I'm like, okay, I'm starting to learn that stuff. That was a long time ago. It's interesting. All right. Thank you. Any, any other comments on Matt before we jump over to Vet? Um, I, I wanted to I wanted to make a comment with Matt uh, on Matt's uh, subject. Um, I have most recently finished up a three year stint with Pratt and Whitney, and we use Domo. I don't know if you've ever heard of Domo before, but Domo um, link, it, it communicates with the ATS system, and it links all of that information um, into Domo, and it breaks it out for you, and so you can see the days to fill. It allows you to choose the visual aid if you want a graph, if you want a pie chart. Um, and I think all of that is great. And that to me allows you to be more of a consultant with your client or customer and say, this is why we do what we do. This is how we do what we do. And I think that that is just supporting data where people are very visual and they can see that and it's an easier sell. So then when you make suggestions and recommendations, the they it has some validity to it because you have that supporting documentation to kind of close the deal on that, if you will. So I think that's a good point. Now. Let's jump over to you, Yvette, for, for your item that you wanted to cover. That you wanted to cover. Okay, so I wanted to talk about four ways that we should be shifting our recruiting strategy during COVID. Um, right now, with about 88% of the workforce working from home, um, and some of some people are still also um, dealing with children who are going to school from home, like myself. So the typical way that you used to recruit, oh yeah, I got a whole academy. It's driving me crazy. So I'm going to put, I used to be a school teacher, but I'm adding that to my resume for sure. <laughs> and this dual role now. But um, the way we used to attract talent is not how we attract talent now. And so I just have four quick things I, I wanted to share. Um, and the first is to ex- expand your um, expand your talent pool faster through video chats. Um, I have been linking in with different people by setting up appointments and meeting them through videos. And that's how it's just a networking opportunity. We have the same interests. We're looking for a similar job. We're in a similar field. I don't know them, but, you know, we were all quarantined together. Let's let's meet up and do that. Um, and that has, that has given me a, a broadband of candidates that do everything. Um, and so that has been very helpful. Um, the second thing is foster the relationship. So once, the, once you've made that connection with the candidate, create a follow-up, whether it's monthly, um, bi-weekly, whatever your bandwidth will allow, but kind of keep the candidate warm and make that connection because we don't have those physical connections. We don't have those meetups that we've had in the past. Um, and then I think also when you're developing that, I think it's a great topic to talk about how are companies um, putting different guidelines and things in place for COVID to prevent the spread, to keep all their employees safe, um, and to ensure the applicant is going to be safe and that their safety is a concern of the company. So I think that's a good talking point during this time. Um, the third thing was definitely social media. I, I'm, I am a social media guru at this point. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram. Between my mom, believe it or not, um, who is in her 70s and my teenager who is 17, I have become the TikTok master for some reason. And <laughs> TikTok is, is all the rage right now. So um, at first I was like, what is this? You know, but then I had to move outside of my comfort zone because I have to change because the, the audience that I'm going after, the millennials and that kind of thing, I need to be cutting edge too. And so then when the kids hear me talk about TikTok, they're like, 
what do you know about TikTok? I'm like, oh, I'm all over it. So I've done that, you know, Instagram, the videos. I am learning to be technically savvy. Again, reaching a different audience that I would normally not reach or not even consider. So um, that has been that has been very helpful to me. Um, and I think also for companies now, they are focusing on that as well. You'll begin to see the branding change. They're doing the commercials. They're doing the little clips and videos on their website. I think William, you were saying, um, giving them a real day in the life of, if you will. And so I think Comcast has done a good job at doing the videos and showing what a day in the life in this position is. And so it may be something that I don't know, something I, I don't do on a regular. I'm able to take that clip and put it in with the communication with my applicant and say, if th this yeah. is what you do, this is what the day in the life is in this role. So I think that that was really good. Um, I like that and, you, and I'm so sorry. Also, I like that you touched upon Comcast because as a Comcast, um, I didn't mean to step on your words, as a Comcast um, customer, I see it in my feed every time I log into my email, like, hey, here's what so-and-so is doing. They're targeting, again, me as a customer to potentially be a candidate. So. That's a great example. Exactly. And I think that also since the candidate can no longer come in person for most of the positions I've been filling, they, this is how they get a feel for the culture of the company that they're applying for and to see if it's going to be a fit for them or not. Um, and then that's a good the piece last early, thing. That's early, early careers. Okay. That, that's a great piece with the early careers candidates, the millennial careers candidates. candidates. They, they love, they eat that up. I think that's great. Exactly. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on with um, fostering the relationship of candidates, one thing I found was bots. I don't know how many of you know what bots are. It's, it's short for robots, but you can put these bots in and basically tell it when to communicate with someone. I guess it's just like scheduling for when I schedule a post on um, uh LinkedIn from Canva, whatever my post is going to be. So you put these bots in and that kind of keeps the communication with the candidate and it's automatic. You customize it and post what you want to post, but it automatically sends it out on a calendar. So you could just do 30 days at a glance for those candidates that you want to keep warm, send the bot out and they'll either respond, but you know that they've gotten it and they have some kind of communication from you so that you could be top of mind when they're you know, available to look or when the opportunity presents itself. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, an um, excellent, that's an excellent suggestion you know, that being able to use technology smartly as a form of communication or vetting or even calendaring uh, that doesn't have to take yeah. as many cycles for you as a recruiter or somebody else. Um, that's brilliant. It doesn't always have to be a, a phone call. Yes, it doesn't always have to be a phone call. And the last thing I, I, I wanted to, um, my fourth point was um, creating a diversity and inclusion strategy. Um, so now with the way culture and everything is moving, this is a hot topic right now, but this is, this is a topic that I just feel like deserves a lot of attention. And so one of the ways that you can, I'm back to William's comment about the capturing um, your information. There is a HR software called gym.com. Um, it's a recruiting software. It integrates with LinkedIn and your email and your ATS system. And it keeps track of all of this for you, your diversity. Um, so that you can kind of see where your pool is. If you... G-E-M or J-A-M? G-E-M. G-E-M dot com. Mm -hmm. there, uh, that's, so, a whole, that's a whole class of tools. Um, there's GEM, there's RecruitBot, there's others that do that kind of drip campaign um, and does it automatically and will stop once they reply. So you're not like badgering them. Right. Exactly, exactly. Um, but um, I think that, that those are the hot spots. Those are the key things that we need to be looking at as we get through COVID. I think we should may have another year of COVID. Um, and well, I, I've been working from home since 2014, so it doesn't bother me, um, but I, I actually don't mind. And I think that, I think that um, 
the management is seeing now that you can have productive employees who are comfortable in their own setting, who are productive. And I think that this is going to last way past COVID. So this may be just a, you know, a permanent change moving forward. So, so let me ask you that. So I'll, I'll challenge you back on that. It's a, a permanent move. I think it's going to, it's moving in that direction. This forced, Hey, everybody works from home has sort of been forced on every manager, right. In the world to make, he's got to let his employees work from home now. Is that going to stay the same or are we going to move back? Hey, you got to come back and work at the company headquarters, what have you. And kind of a deeper question on that. And this is sort of, sort of anecdotal. I don't have too much information on this, but a lot of recruiters were able in 2020 to recruit for people who were away from the headquarters, right? But they could still yeah. work. Yeah. If, if we see a light at the end of the tunnel and we, COVID starts to dissipate with the vaccine or what have you, are we starting to see a shift where, hey, you can work from home, but you got to live in the local area. So when we come back, everybody's coming back to the office. I think it's a mix. And I think it's a mix because, you know, as LinkedIn and a lot of publications out there pointed out, if you open up your, where people can work, you open up the opportunity to hire diversity, right? Diversity of thought, all kinds of diversity. So I think it's going to be a blend. I think you're going to have some companies that are open to it that see that it's possible, that this has been a guinea pig time. And then, you know, there are some roles that I'm recruiting for that will be working, for example, directly with the executive team. And so we are adamant. Yeah, you might be remote for the next year, but when the time comes, you have to be in Cambridge because we need you to influence those executive leads in person. So I think it's going to be mixed. I think every company is going to be different. Yeah. I agree with that. I think it's going to be a hybrid, a hybrid model, maybe. It could be a mix of the remote and in office, but I think there's something to say about in office. I mean, I think people like that high touch and um, it, it may be, it may be that hybrid though. We've not put stuff on our website yet because we don't know how state and municipalities are going to come out with policies going forward. So we don't want to preempt or get ahead of that, but you've got some, you got some big issues to, to, to talk about. Um, how do how do you help people that are, uh, associate or new to the workforce really scale up. I mean, they were hopping jobs before and that was coming into the office. What hope do they have of now if they don't have a strong mentorship program, intentionally yeah. developing people? It's almost like you got to have you know a university program internally for the people that you hire. Um, it also is very biased in, to um, knowledge workers. That's not everybody. Um, so you, you can have a whole other class system the people that can work from home and the people that can't. You got to think about a little bit about equity from that. And then I think to Matt and maybe Jessica's point was, you, know, you just can't manufacture water cooler, coffee machine, coffee, uh, coffee pot conversations on your calendar. Those just happen. And if you're not in proximity, how are you going to do that? Uh, how do you come up with those sort of creative problem solving? So I don't think it's going to be one way or the other. I, I do think you'll, I agree that it'll be like a hybrid, like Matt, we just, um, allowed everybody to work remotely in the U.S. wherever you want. But the trade-off is, is you have to be willing to come to the corporate office once a quarter for team and company meetings on your dime. Yeah. So that that's how we're that's, walking this path. So I think a lot of companies will, I like that. will try it and we'll see what works. I'm not saying ours is, is, is right think. or what will work, but, but we'll, we'll find out pretty quick, right? But I, but I also have a lot of people that I've talked to, you know, for example, that, that VP job I'm hiring for right now that in Florida that have said, uh, you know, I'll pay myself. I don't, this is where I want to live, but I don't, you know, this may be a whole, on a whole other can of worms, but I'm finding a lot of people moving during this time. Right. You know, for example, a lot of people seem to be fleeing San Francisco and Los Angeles, um, those areas, you know, Boston, a lot of my peers have moved um, out to the country, but it'll be interesting when things come back to normal. What about when the pay changes when you do make that move? Hey, right. you can move, but you're not going to be getting market okay. rates of a right. San Francisco company if you're moving to Montana. Exactly. That yep. may, I don't know. So mm -hmm. we, we've actually not changed our pay structure at all. So as long as you're not in the Bay Area or New York or certain parts of New Jersey, you're going to make out okay. We just don't try to hire that many people from there, Matt, unfortunately. We, we know they're good. We just yeah. don't try to explain to them 
that it's worth moving from those areas unless they're planning to move. If that company's based in New York and they someone moves to, you know, uh, Kansas. Right. There, the what pay would may ship. Yeah, exactly. Right. Facebook has said that they would do that. Um, I, I think that's a little demotivating unless there's other factors in play that are as strong or stronger than just the cash comp. I don't yeah. know. You're, you're finding out a lot about companies these days with how they handle yeah. these yeah. prices. It, this goes back to what Yvette was saying about that brand and controlling it. Because if you're not speaking to it, the world is just talking about, I don't want to bring in cancel culture or anything like that. But boy, if you get caught doing something you shouldn't be doing, the world's going to know about it. Yeah. I mean, you should be doing but something that other people don't like or what have you, but it'll be interesting. Well, hey, particularly candidates, remember how they make you feel, as do employees for some reason. They have very long memories. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the lack of callback or lack of transparency, they, they, they remember this stuff. I'll never forget that company that treated me poorly. And that was 15 years ago. You're not going to name it? I'd be hard pressed to. <laughs> yeah. It's a Don't do company. it. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Let me just put it this way. It's a review company, a company that you'll find reviews on. But that's all I'll say. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, all, we all got our stories to tell, I think, especially in being in recruiting. If you work in an agency, you got to see the insides of a lot of how managers of different companies do their yeah. hiring and stuff. It's, it's interesting. You learn a lot being a recruiter. I'll tell you that. Hey, Yvette, do you have a handle on TikTok that you're willing to share? Um, not yet, because right now I just have to see kids, but I am going She's to doing start dances trying on there. to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm dancing with my kids and my grandkids on there, but um, <laughs> I am going to, um, I'm going to be starting to TikTok because I feel like I can reach my audience there. Um, I do some career coaching, um, training in, in classes like that. And I think that I could reach a whole nother um, audience with that middle kind of range there. Um, and there are a lot of adults my age on there too. So I'm just going to try it and see, and I'll share it with you next time, Sean. <laughs> I, I remember when Facebook was just coming out and growing. The question of the day for recruiters was, well, do I have my professional Facebook account and my personal Facebook account? I don't want <laughs> yes, remember that? Yeah, I remember true. when Brian started um, advertising on Instagram and I was like, what is, what is going on? And here we are today. Very interesting. LinkedIn. I love thing. Instagram. Yeah. I love all of it though. I love, I love how it has just evolved from like when I was a little girl and we had, we got in the Commodore 64, like that was the big deal back then. And I was like, my father is, is no longer here with me now, but I'm like, my father would have just died to see a phone where you can do the video and talk to each other. And then just to pick it up and ask such something, what is this? And, it, and Siri just tells you, because I would ask my father stuff all the time and he'd be like, go to the card catalog and look it up. Like he'd be taking me to the library. And now I'm just like, Google, how do I re how do I turn on the pilot light to, to the tank heater? And it just and it just comes up. So I love the evolve of the technology. And I do I do I do think it makes your kids lazy though. My kids don't know anything. They're stupid. Right. <laughs> I, I've had, Siri knows everything. I, I've deleted TikTok, I think, four times from my phone, and I keep going back to, to bringing it back, but I just get mad yes. every time I'm on there for an hour and a half. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, we, I love it. We're no, you bet I did one. You were on a panel of talkers, so you got you got a little taste of that one. Uh, hey, I, we're coming to the hour, so I'm going to just sort of cut it here. But I want to thank everybody for attending and for the panelists for helping me and kick it back into a nice, nice show for starting off 2021. We should have having uh, quite a few good ones more this year. You did mention bots. We have a, a a session on bots. I think it's the third week of this month that we'll be doing. I'll post that to the whole group too, so we have it. But once again, thank you everybody uh, thank you. for attending and the panels. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so All much. Bye-bye. Right, thank you, everyone. Have a good Thanks, day. Thanks, everyone. Good day. You too.